on World News Tonight. Mariupol bombarded. Russian forces are accused of focusing attacks on civilian concentrated areas, killing swaths of innocents taking shelter in the regions. New fears arise on the conflict being taken to a new level of brutality. Migrant crisis. Ukrainians have lost their homes and now pouring out of the country, overwhelming the European neighbors. Meanwhile, America faces an influx of Russian refugees fleeing their country in opposition to the onslaught. Rebounding infections. Countries around the world have mixed responses to fresh wave of the pandemic. While some nations celebrate a steep decline of infections, others show concern as deaths re-emerge. And synchronized support. Ukrainians and other dancers from across the globe gather in a beautiful show of support to Ukraine. This is Other There in a World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight this Monday night. And yet again, our top stories begins with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Russia has been relentlessly targeting Mariupol and now Russia has issued an ultimatum demanding that the city surrenders by the next morning or else. If Russia were to take that port city, it would link up the controls to the region of the south. Ukrainians say that 90% of the city of Mariupol have already been destroyed. The brutality of the Russian onslaught on Mariupol grows more dire by the hour. The heart-stopping sounds of shelling every few seconds. People lining up for supplies, cooking what little food they have in the streets. A dead body on a bench. And days after a theater was leveled, tonight yet another rescue operation is underway as Ukrainian authorities say Russia bombed an art school with about 400 people taking shelter inside. Ukrainian's President Zelensky saying the assault on Mariupol will go down in the history of war crimes. The city council there says that Russian troops have rounded up thousands of residents and sent them to so-called filtration camps to be processed before being deported to Russia. But meanwhile, Russians are seeing an entirely different story on state TV, claiming evacuees are arriving in Russia willingly. Also today, Ukraine's deputy prime minister, citing intelligence reports, says there are signs the Russians are preparing to capture the humanitarian corridor near the ravaged city of Kharkiv with landmines. This woman just escaped from that region, terrified. During the bombing, she was trapped in her basement for hours with her two children. No water, no electricity, and she had to leave her husband behind. In this security footage, obtained by the New York Times, would appear to be Russian soldiers storm an apartment building earlier this month outside Kiev. The Times reports they took up sniper positions in the building and held some residents hostage. But more signs of resistance, defiant Ukrainians protesting in Russian-controlled Kherson. Still, for the second straight day, Russia's Ministry of Defense says it used hypersonic missiles in combat, the so-called dagger weapons that fly up to 10 times the speed of sound, and that analysts say mark an escalation of the war, since the missiles can evade air defense systems. It is extremely important that we prevent this conflict becoming a full-fledged war uh, between NATO and Russia. <laughs> As many in this country pray for an end to the bloodshed, tonight a solemn tribute. Ukrainians kneeling on the side of the road, honoring one of their fallen soldiers. The crisis in Ukraine turned millions of Ukrainians into refugees. Though many of them have been offered a safe haven in neighboring countries, they continue to endure bitterly cold weather. European officials on Sunday said their countries were running out of room to comfortably house some of the nearly 3.5 million refugees who have fled Ukraine since Russia's invasion. Most have arrived at border points in Poland, Slovakia, Romania and Hungary, according to data compiled by the UN Refugee Agency, putting pressure on the EU countries trying to shelter them. At Poland's busiest crossing, Jorge Galindo, a communications officer for the International Organization for Migration, said there are reports that another surge of refugees may be coming. We don't know how many people and we don't know when they will arrive. What we can say for sure is that 
you know, after three weeks since the start of the war, we continue seeing flows on a daily basis, over 10,000 a day just in, uh, at this border crossing alone, Medica. More than two million Ukrainians have fled to Poland. In the capital of Warsaw, refugees waited in line for a third day in front of the national stadium, which has been temporarily turned into an administrative office to register new arrivals. Natalia Strzelkova arrived in Poland from an area near the Ukrainian city of Dnipro. Rockets started to fly and residents saw it. It's difficult, it becomes scary, panic starts and you want to run away somewhere. It's harder because of children. We were worried that something would happen to them. Ukraine's deputy prime minister said seven humanitarian corridors would open on Sunday to enable civilians to leave frontline areas. While Europe is saturated with refugees from the countries, America is also seeing a major influx of migrants at the border, most being Ukrainians, but also certain Russians that have fled their home country following mass protests against the conflict, leading to claims of discrimination. A new batch of asylum seekers are popping up at the U.S.-Mexico border. Russians who are against the war in Ukraine. While U.S. officials have let dozens of Ukrainians through this week, Russians remain in limbo, prompting some to camp out on the pavement alongside a barbed wire border fence, defying warnings from Mexican authorities to leave. One woman told she had fled Russia with her children after being arrested at an anti-war protest there and said she burst into tears when she was rebuffed at the U.S. border as Ukrainians were let in. Mark, a restaurant manager who came from Moscow with his wife, flying to Mexico via Turkey and Germany in early March, called it discrimination. He and his wife were arrested for three days last year after protesting in support of jailed opposition leader Alexei Navalny and said going back to Russia was not an option after new legislation that imposes up to 15 years in jail for actions found to discredit Russia's army. The devastation in Ukraine has caused 3 million Ukrainians to become refugees, according to the United Nations, most of them in bordering countries. Some Ukrainians crossing in Tijuana have been granted permission to stay in the United States for a year. But thousands of Russians have also left their country, according to media reports. Mikhail Shlyakov said returning to Russia meant fighting in a war he opposed. When asked on Thursday about Ukrainians and Russians at the border, U.S. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas said the government was helping people fleeing Ukraine and that other programs were being considered to expand humanitarian aid. Between October 2021 and January, U.S. government data showed border officials encountered about 6,400 Russians, some of whom said they were dissidents and are now in the U.S. As the Russians wait, U.S. border officials have also turned away asylum seekers from Nigeria, Colombia, Honduras, and Mexico, sparking complaints of unfair treatment. The Saudi Energy Ministry and state media said that Yemen's Iran-aligned Houthi group fired missiles and drones at Saudi energy and water desalination facilities, causing a temporary drop in output at a refinery, but no casualties. Houthi rebels have struck inside Saudi Arabia. A barrage of drone and missile strikes have hit some of the country's critical energy facilities. A fire was started at one site, whilst oil production was temporarily cut at the site of oil giant Aramco. The rebels' military spokesperson said it was in response to Saudi-led coalition attacks in Yemen. As part of its legitimate response to the continuation of the aggression and the unjust siege on our people, the armed forces carried out a large-scale military operation, the first phase of which included the bombing of a number of vital and sensitive facilities of the Saudi enemy affiliated with Aramco. The Saudi-led military alliance said the attacks did not cause any casualties and that they managed to thwart another attack. Yemen's conflict started in 2014 after the Iran-backed Houthis seized the capital Sana'a and swept across the north. A coalition led by the Gulf Kingdom responded with a devastating aerial campaign, but peace talks have since stalled and the conflict continues to rage on. The Houthis have demanded that any negotiations take place in a neutral country. The attacks combined with the war in Ukraine are threatening already volatile oil prices. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News.
Welcome back to World News Tonight. The COVID wave is making its way back to the origin. New reports show that China has reported its first ever COVID death in over a year. This follows an unusual surge in cases in the country. Mainland China reported its first COVID-19 deaths in more than a year over the weekend. That's according to the National Health Commission, which said that two people died in the northeastern region of Jilin and that one of the dead was not vaccinated. Though small by international standards, China has been battling its worst COVID outbreak since the virus first emerged in Wuhan in 2020. On Sunday, the country's new daily cases continued to register in the thousands, bringing the total number of cases to more than 130,000. For all of 2021, China reported only two COVID deaths at the start of last year. The country is maintaining a dynamic clearance approach to control the spread of the virus, unlike many other countries that have chosen to live with it. That involves stringent measures such as short and targeted shutdowns and quick testing schemes where cases are found. Jilin, which borders North Korea and Russia, accounts for more than two-thirds of domestic infections in the latest wave. The United States have been warned against a rise in COVID-19 cases. However, Dr. Anthony Fauci says that the nation is not expected to go back to the previous state of strict restrictions. The top U.S. infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, has predicted a rise in COVID-19 cases in the United States, similar to the uptick seen in the U.K. Yet when asked about restrictions in a Sunday interview on ABC, he did not advocate for tightening rules again. I don't see us going back into any more really very restrict kinds of restrictions, but you always have to have the flexibility. A World Health Organization spokesperson said on Friday that the end of the COVID-19 pandemic was a long way off. COVID-19 cases increased around the world last week. A combination of factors has caused the spike, including the highly transmissible Omicron variant and its cousin, the BA2 subvariant. The WHO pointed to lockdowns around Asia and the battle in China's Jilin province to contain an outbreak. The UN Health Agency has previously said that the acute phase of the pandemic could end this year, but it says it would depend on how quickly its target is met to vaccinate 70% of the population in each country, among other factors. Though we are seeing a drop in the number of infections in South Korea after what health experts have called the peak last week, authorities remain on high alert while at the same time slightly easing social distancing guidelines. South Korea on Monday reported 209,169 new infections, bringing the total number of infections to over 9.5 million. Monday's figure was a drop of more than 120,000 from a day ago. And it was the first time in 10 days that the daily tally came down to the 200,000 range. However, the number of critically ill patients has stayed above the 1,000 mark for two weeks straight. The exact tally is 1,130. 329 more people have died, bringing the total death toll to 12,757. While South Korean officials have recognized that these COVID-19 figures have risen, they say it's not to the extent that threatens its medical capacity. In a bid to get life back to normal, authorities have also decided to ease some social distancing guidelines. The main change is to allow larger private gatherings of up to eight people. This is two more than what have been a maximum of six people up to Sunday. Business hours for restaurants and cafes will remain the same, though, having to close at 11 p.m. Health authorities have decided to modify their antivirus measures now, despite concerns from some health experts that the scale of the pandemic could expand amid the surge of Omicron. Officials said, though, that they would only make slight tweaks to the extent that it doesn't make the situation worse or increase strain on the medical system. This explains why they've decided to not extend business operation hours from 11 p.m. to midnight. Another new COVID-19 measure to kick off from Monday is giving boosters to teens aged 12 to 17 who had their second vaccine shot more than three months ago. North Korea is yet to report on its four shots fired from its multiple rocket launchers over the weekend, which is unusual as the regime normally makes a report on its activity the next morning. North Korea stayed quiet on Monday on its test firing of artillery the previous day. 
None of its state media, such as the Korean Central News Agency, have announced any related reports, which could mean the latest activity was a part of the regime's ongoing wintertime military exercises. The North on Sunday fired four rounds from multiple rocket launchers into the West Sea from an unidentified location in Pyongyang-Namdo province. Such a silence is a rare move considering the regime is usually quick to report on major missile launches and successful new weapons tests. For instance, the regime did not issue a word about the apparent failure of an ICBM launch last Thursday, but Pyongyang boasted about the launch of an ICBM disguised as a reconnaissance satellite earlier this month. South Korea's Unification Ministry said on Monday that Seoul will manage situations on the Korean Peninsula peacefully and stably and prepare for all possibilities. We urge the North to immediately halt unilateral moves that go against peace and stability in the region and come to the path of dialogue and cooperation suggested by Seoul and the international community. South Korea's National Security Council also held an emergency meeting on Sunday and said the country's military will maintain a strong readiness posture based on the alliance with the U.S. to make sure there is a no lapse in security during the upcoming change of administration. Meanwhile, the North's weekly propaganda publication, Tongil Shinbo, lashed out at Seoul and Washington on Monday for looking to carry out joint military drills next month, calling the move an obvious provocation. We have some good news for you. Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women, but it is often not detected in its early stages because symptoms are not noticeable. Another factor that delays the detection of cervical cancer is the psychological distress of getting tested. South Korean researchers have now developed a method of detecting cervical cancer through a urine test. According to the World Health Organization, cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in females. However, early detection and vaccination have made cervical cancer the only type of cancer that has decreased in prevalence over the past decade. Unfortunately, there has actually been an increase of 8.1 percent among young women in their 20s and 30s over the past nine years. In South Korea, any adult woman can receive a free cervical examination once every two years. But the actual screening rate among women in their 20s is a mere 20 percent. Going to the OBGYN itself can cause psychological distress, as can the testing method. To encourage testing among younger women, South Korean researchers have successfully developed a new screening method for cervical cancer through a urine test that can be self-conducted. A classifier has been developed that emits fluorescence when met with cysteine in the urine of people with cervical cancer. And compared to the existing method for screening that takes up to a week, this new method gives results in under 30 minutes. The test needs 200 microliters. That's roughly one drop. That's enough for the test. The classifier emits yellow fluorescence when cervical cancer is detected in just 5 to 10 minutes, a maximum of 30 minutes. More than 1,700 clinical samples show that this new method of testing yields results quickly and also has a high accuracy of 90 percent. The researchers explained that they have completed the patent application for this developed technology and they are now looking to commercialize this new technology to be used in general checkups for women or in the form of diagnostic kits. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, in an address to the Israel parliament, questioned Tel Aviv's reluctance to provide missile defense to its country or sanctioning Russia over the war. Family, sports figures and entertainers bid farewell to Australian cricketing legend Shane Warne at a private funeral held in his hometown in Melbourne. A car drove at high speed into a group of Belgian carnival performers who were preparing a parade, killing six people and seriously injuring ten others. The incident did not appear to be a militant attack. 2021 was the warmest year on record for the world's oceans as Australia's Great Barrier Reef reportedly faces a fourth mass bleaching of coral in just six years. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority said that most of the marine park had been hit by significant heat stress over the summer. A wounded Taylor Fritz brought Rafael Nadal's 20-match winning run to an end with a victory in the Indian Wells final, becoming the first American to lift the title since Andre Agassi over two decades ago.
the latest team of Russian cosmonauts that successfully made it to the International Space Station was seen wearing distinct yellow suits. However, they cleared it as it was due to an extra material being available in the color and not in response to the conflict in Ukraine. Three Russian cosmonauts arrived safely at the International Space Station on Friday and were warmly welcomed by four Americans, two Russians and a German crewmate already aboard. But it was the color of the Russian crew's uniforms that caught the eye of Western observers. Were the brightly colored yellow and blue outfits a supportive nod to the Ukrainian flag? Russia's space agency Roscosmos on Saturday said no. On its Telegram channel, its press service said bluntly, Sometimes yellow is just yellow. First Director General Dmitry Rogozin was more acerbic on his personal telegram channel, saying that Russian cosmonauts had no sympathy for Ukrainian nationalists. In a live-streamed news conference from the ISS on Friday, Mission Commander Oleg Artemyev was asked about the suits. Every crew picks the suits, the overalls, on their own accord, so that they don't all look the same, but different. Now, it was our turn to pick the colour. The truth is, we had accumulated a lot of yellow material, so we needed to use it up. That's why we had to wear yellow flight suits. Russian Mission Control responded, Great, our congratulations. They look wonderful. Rogozin has suggested that U.S. sanctions imposed in response to the invasion could destroy ISS teamwork and lead to the space station falling out of orbit. Russia invaded Ukraine, which has a blue and yellow flag, on February 24th. The ensuing fighting has killed thousands of people, devastated parts of cities, and caused more than three million Ukrainians to flee their homes, according to the United Nations. Officials at the U.S. space agency NASA have said U.S. and Russian crew members are aware of events on Earth, but that their work has not been affected by geopolitical tensions. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with visuals of leading performances from across the globe, including Russia and Ukraine, taking part in the sellout program, Dance for Ukraine, charity gala at the London Colosseum Theatre. Thank you for watching us again. Have a good night. <laughs>